it's three times. Three times in a row we've come to you. Three Pete. Matt and Matt. We're both back again. Nobody's gotten arrested or fired or taken away by I'm those say that. This hasn't come out yet. Those Scientology people. They haven't come to collect us yet, but someday they will. Well, I mean, you know, if we keep talking to Leah Remini. Oh, is that her that's name? True. Is that how you say it? Yeah, I think so. You nailed it. Mm-hmm. Okay. She's getting the most can, can publicity. I just call her the, the girl from the Malibu Sands episodes of uh, Say by the Bell? You could do that. Stacey Carosi. That's her name. Yes. Carosi. That's yeah. what you remember? Ah, that's what we're talking about today. Stacey Carosi, a whole episode. Um, that's not true. We're going to talk a little bit about... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would love to talk a whole episode about the Malibu Sands I wonder episodes. if people would listen to that. Uh, let's, it's Christmas time. We're going to talk a little Christmas movies. We're talking about leading men. We're talking about the lights men. in Hollywood. We're talking about a little everything today. Oh, yeah. So uh, anything to tell the people before we begin? I hope they enjoy it. And uh, this is going to be the most scandalous episode yet. I don't know if that's true, but let's just I hope so. In the trade. So Tom Cruise has thrown around his Hollywood weight and has taken over a little film called The Mummy. You remember this original movie, Matt? Now, which one are we talking about? Because there have been many iterations of The Mummy. Oh, that is true. There's been Hollywood movies. There's been, has there been a sci-fi version of The Mummy? Uh, like made for TV. Like Sharknado. I'm, I, gotta yeah, you know, I, think they, like I think the director, uh, Russell McKay, the guy who did um, uh, the, the original Highlander, I, I believe he did one. Oh, okay. Around the same time he did... Uh, the Casper Van Dien version of uh, Tarzan. Nice. Well, yeah. we are talking about uh, franchises and uh, and things such as that. What we want to talk about today is: Has there ever been a giant actor take over a role from a another actor the way that Tom Cruise has taken over the Mummy from Brendan Fraser? I, I can think of two. Give them to me. Okay. Uh, there's The Rock who took over for Brendan Fraser on the sequel to Journey. Oh, to so the right away Earth. we've got a theme. The Brendan Fraser theme. Oh, wait. You know what? Uh, oh, they only did that one Looney Tunes back in action. Oh, yeah. Because he was true. in that. There you go. So, whatever. Um, and then uh, Christian Bale. Yes. Uh, when, uh, let me cut that part. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then there's Ben Affleck. Took over for Christian Bale for the new Batman. Oh, okay. Right. And you could even go with uh, basically any of the Batman. They've kind of traded up. That is kind of true. Yeah. That is the one franchise you see. You know, we'll talk a little bit about James Bond and Indiana Jones and that kind of stuff. But the Batmans have traded up a lot uh, from their meager beginnings of Michael Keaton, who then disappeared and then came back. Right now, now would you consider uh, going from Michael Keaton to Val Kilmer a trade up, trade sideways? I, well, I don't it's know. A trade side, and now it might be a down, but at the time it was sideways at worst. You know, like one half a step up. Right, because he was coming off of Tombstone. Exactly. And Tombstone's just, his performance in that's just one of the best things ever. Uh, and one of the best movies ever. Right. Yeah, I'll, I agree. Right on that. Um, yeah, so, uh, so okay, so that was the Sideways. Who was next? Uh, George Clooney? Yeah, that's a Do big trade Do we count trade-up. that? He, I think getting him as an actor is a trade-up, but the movie's a big Yeah, yeah. it was. Uh, it, big was it had the nipples and everything, right? And uh, so. <laughs> and then and he it, went from that to uh, Christian Bale. Sure. And in terms of acting quality. Oh, because he was coming off of American Psycho, so yeah, that's a that's a big trade. up. Definitely trade up. And now we have the biggest movie star in the world, Batfleck, former J Lo lover, Ben Affleck. <laughs> Do you still I, think I, he thinks about that? I gotta think so. I mean, he's probably still got to be asked about that. I mean, it has a fancy name to it. Do you think he was ever fucking Jennifer Garner while thinking about J Lo? And probably vice versa too. He's a man, sir. <laughs> He has needs. Right. Um, well, the one that I'm going to throw out to you that's going to be a little blast from the past because that's where I bring all my movies from, uh, Mel Gibson redid the role in uh, from the original movie. He was in Payback. Yes. Lee Marvin was the original person in that movie. If we want to go with... Point uh, blank. If we want to go with Mel Gibson, Tom yes. Hardy took over for Mel Gibson for uh, Mad Max. Oh, now, yes. Now, if this happened back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, I don't think it would be a trade-up. Right. But, but then Malibu happened. Malibu happened. That's right. And now he is. Uh, did you ever see that? He's back though. We'll, we'll sidetrack real quick. Uh, did you ever see that movie that he uh, Jody Foster made with the him? Beaver? The Beaver. <laughs> yes, with the hand up the thing. No, was, I didn't. That was uh, <clears throat> that was something. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it was a movie. It was a movie. Did James Bond always trade up? I don't think they've mostly traded up because they try to find somebody that's lesser so they can bring it 
to a Bond role rather than be the person who it is? You know, I don't know if they trade up. It's just uh, they age out. Oh, that's fair. You enough. know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's the way you have to look at those because I, I don't think you're gonna, anyone's going to say Timothy Dalton is a trade up right. from Roger Moore at his prime. But by the end, by the end of it, he was what sixty, seventy three, no, probably <laughs> we, sixty. We yes, that. that is probably true. Right. So yeah, th- at that point, you're not really trading up for prime to prime. It's just, yeah, he got too old to you know run around and bang young chicks. Right. So they kicked him out. Um, uh, one that I thought of earlier that just makes me laugh that nobody pretends like exist ever, but uh, was the Shia LaBeouf trying to take over Indiana Jones for Although Harrison Ford? He never got a shot. It was just that one little bit at the right. end of the movie, um, but thankfully we never got that. Hopefully we'll never get another one. The, the monkeys in the in the trees were probably where that hit the wall. Uh, the, I think the movie hit the wall in the opening shot wow. because the whole thing was when they were making it, hey, we're not going to do CGI. We're not going to rely on these new tricks. We're going to do old school filmmaking. And then literally the first shot of the movie has a terrible looking CGI robot. It did. And honestly, if they wanted to foreshadow, that should have been an anthill. Oh, I see what you're doing there. Yes. Yeah, that would have been great, right? Little, and that, that that's the most sidetrack. You... Most frustrating thing about that movie is it'll do something really cool, and then something incredibly stupid right after. And that. Do you so, think that that was in the script, and then everybody, the 27 people that had a choice afterwards, took it out at some point in time? I think everyone just gave up trying to argue with George Lucas. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Sometimes that happens. So, uh, do we have any? Sad feelings for Brendan Fraser. Hopefully, maybe he can pick up. Oh, you know what? He could take over National Treasure from um, from uh, from um, him. I would. L- <laughs> yeah, actually, that wouldn't that wouldn't be bad. I'm telling you, that's all. I'm here to, to cast that. new yeah. people. I would love to see Brendan Fraser as an old Superman. Like get him like when he was in like really good shape. Mm-hmm. He has that kind of look, that kind of nerdiness. Like especially if you watch uh, as silly as it is, Bedazzled. Did not, but uh, dude has a little bit of range. I'd like to see him as an old superhero. It's that time of year again, holiday season, as they say, or at least the car companies tell me they sell me a lot of holiday stuff. More importantly, though, it's Christmas movie time. Yes, people love themselves some Christmas movies. It seems like that's the holiday where people always go, I got this one movie that I watch every year. And it tells me that it's Christmas time. I think that and Halloween. Most people usually have like a horror movie. Well, Halloween. you just hang out with weirdos. I hang out with normal people. They're just like mm. nice, pretty, fluffy okay. things. That's all we do. All right. So anyways, uh, Christmas movies. I've uh, been watching them since we were children. All I knew when I was a child was A Wonderful Life. I didn't know there was any other Christmas movies that existed. Because I didn't see that until this year. That's how my family was. So we definitely grew up a little differently, I would say. Um. The only tradition we have in our family is every Thanksgiving after dinner, we watch National Barbed Lampoon's, oh. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Well, that seems reasonable. That's the only tradition we have. That seems reasonable. There's nothing wrong with that. It's much better than, say, um, some of these movies that, we, that we'll talk about <laughs> over this, uh, this segment. I got uh, a question. We well, before we get into this, because okay. we're about to Do list it. a whole bunch of movies of varying quality. Sure. Oh, yes. Because they're Christmas movies. Mm-hmm. Do you think people go easier on them? Because there are a lot of bad Christmas movies that I don't mind watching this time of year. I watched Jingle All the Way last night. Mm. Uh, yes, to answer your question and uh, to follow up with that answer, Hollywood is not stupid. They have figured this out over <laughs> the years, and they do know that if you put a Christmas theme in a movie and release it anytime between November 20th and December 25th, you're going to get people to go. Like, it's just guaranteed. Do you think that's why they took the Love Actually formula and they've done it for pretty much every other holiday and it hasn't worked? Yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. I just... Breakthrough. Yeah, let's call studios. Let them know. They're not going to listen to us, but we can let no. them know anyhow. Um, I really like holiday movies and that aren't holiday movies. Um, let me guess. Uh, Die Hard? Nope. Uh, I'm seeing uh, A Lethal Weapon. And if you were more of a nerd, I'd say probably uh, Iron Man 3. Oh, my God. I just named all Shane Black movies. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> missed the one that I was going to list. Kiss, Bang, Bang. Yeah, that was yeah. the one that I was going to list. <laughs> That's the one that I care about. Um, the rest of them, you know, I see people on the on the social medias talk about Lethal Weapon and my holidays don't start until I hear the, the evil guy say whatever he says. I think that's silly. I don't believe those people, if you want to be honest with you. I don't think they played Lethal Weapon a lot on TV when I was younger. 
And no. that's where you're going to get people of our age to have watched something a lot. Lethal Weapon 2, I think, was played That's more. true. Absolutely. But a movie that is played all the time. That's because first Lethal Weapon took 30 minutes to get to anything. That's true. Um, and it doesn't have uh, Joe Pesci. That's true. Um, but I think, honestly, one of the, uh, the, the one that I hear more than Lethal Weapon is Die Hard. That's the one I hear all the time. Where people are like, you know, my favorite Christmas movie is. Right. It's one you don't think and is Die Hard. Everybody thinks it's yeah. Die Hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think people really like the. Uh, I guess dichotomy would be the best word. The dichotomy between um, the happy, cheery Christmas time and then stuff blowing up and people getting murdered. Yeah, lots of blood and action. Right. Which is kiss, kiss, bang, bang for sure. Now, what about um, Christmas horror movies? Like, uh, Scrooge is the only Christmas horror movie that I'm I'm aware of. I watched that one and that I watched. Too. Um, I watched that when I was 12. Uh, freaked me out a little bit. My brain didn't. Buster Poindexter it. freaks me out, and I'm 34. <laughs> <laughs> but it was probably the first uh, first uh, movie of his that I go, oh, I actually like this Bill Murray's movies. Um, really? I didn't like. Yeah, I don't, I'm not a big 80s Bill Murray movie fan. Uh, sorry, guys out there. I'm gonna be I, I just realized that there are two Richard Donner movies on this list. Oh, he's yeah. see, again, he was smart. Yeah. Based around Christmas, people will watch it every year. It's a thing to go back to, uh, which is certainly weird. Is there an archetype that you think of when you think of Christmas movies? What do you mean? Uh, as far as the, I mean, even we could talk about tropes of Christmas movies, oh. the things that have to, to come up. Well, I mean, I think for... it's going to automatically, it, unlike Halloween movies, you know, that we talked about in episode one, um, where basically people will watch anything that's horror maybe even like horror sci-fi. Sure. Um, those, I think, have actual tropes, right? Um, those are like, they're a genre out of form. Mm -hmm. What makes all of these Christmas movies is the fact they take place at Christmas and have lights and stockings and stuff. Let me sidetrack you there for a minute and ask you a specific question. Is Almost Famous a Christmas movie because the entire intro is about her having Christmas during the summer? Because the corporations have taken Ooh. over Christmas. No. Okay. No. Okay, we can go back um, to what we're talking about. But I will say Prometheus is a Christmas movie. That takes place at Christmas. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah. And, and it's easy to be able to to utilize that uh, to get the family element working into the movie, to get your waterworks going because they live for something. Right, and also it's uh, it's a way of making, what we usually people think about Christmas, it's warm, homey, cozy. Right, right. Those kinds of feelings, that kind of, uh, the you feel the way Home Alone looks, <laughs> you know, just like like a Campbell's soup commercial from the eighties. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's used a lot of times in movies, and Shane Black likes it especially because it sets you up for again the opposite of what's actually going to happen, and having that kind of surrounding while people are blowing up cars. Mm -hmm. Um, gives you a very odd feeling you don't usually get. Like you can capitalize off that time of year more than I think kind of any time of year. You know, there are so many things that people associate it with that you can utilize right. for exactly. their emotions, the working or manipulating their emotions. Uh, uh, you know, I take that back when you ask about horror movies. Gremlins, I would count Gremlins. that as a horror movie and a Christmas movie. Have you seen Krampus? <laughs> I've not seen Krampus. Have you seen Krampus? I've not seen Krampus. Krampus no. is great. Okay, well, it is the time of year and to do that. Dark as hell. Okay, I'm on yeah, board. Like, I thought it was going to be uplifting in any way. Yeah. Not. Okay, so <laughs> Krampus is on the list. Uh, it certainly has to be better than Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, go to hell. I don't like him. I don't like his films. I don't hate them. I'm not vitriol against him. But, uh, no, that was, um, um, that was the other guy. Goose. Oh, well, yeah, but I'm talking about the director. The director <clears throat> did Coraline and... That. Yeah, I don't. That I'm not fantastic. Yeah, I'm not. You it's not for me. Went with the church group, actually. In that husk of a body. Well, that's you. true. Well, <laughs> that's a different story for a different time, though. And that's probably why one of my favorite Christmas movies is The Ref. Also, okay. one of the worst Christmas movies because it's a terrible movie. Yeah, it's a bad movie. But I do it, yeah. like revisiting that movie during this time of year. I think there's. I have a question. Did you like all those like Ralph Bashke kind of stop motion animation? No. Okay, I think that might be one of the reasons you don't care for Nightmare Before Christmas. Could be. Also, I think that that movie would be better, <clears throat> excuse me, if Tim you Burton took the 70-minute running time mm -hmm. and cut it down to 60. If that was like a TV special, mm -hmm. 
It'll be better because there's a, a slog about 35, 40 minutes in. We can cut out about 10 minutes. I think there's unnecessary filler to make it interesting. Yeah, but you put it on TV, though, and then it's com- uh, competing with the uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer stop, yeah, so stop animation, and it, it is not going to be better than that. That is blasphemous, sir. That's the wrong I'm walking out of this room. About. Well, no, but I was talking. I was just comparing Nightmare Before Christmas as far yeah, as... So much better. Uh, so much better. The music alone is fantastic. You know, tell us about Jingle All the Way. Uh, Jingle all the way. I haven't seen this in a oh, while. Uh, this was yeah. the Arnold Schwarzenegger it's movie. It's so terrible. Correct? Yeah? It's terrible in every way, but there's something I kind of love about the terrible factor. In mm-hmm. it, right? Like, first of all, I like Arnold. Like, who doesn't like watching Arnold? Sure. That's why he's a movie star. Um, then you have Phil Hartman. And I've got the biggest soft spot in my heart for Sinbad. I don't know what it is. I mm. love Sinbad. And, again, I know it's not a good movie. I know it's not. But my kids like it. I'll watch it. There you go. Whatever. Yeah, it is Here, what it is. I put this on the list, and uh, I'm not even sure if you're familiar with this film, but uh, when I worked in the movie theater, it was on, and so I had to watch it, and it's become not a favorite of mine, but if it's on the TV, I might stop and watch It's called Just Friends. A uh, little yes. movie with uh, Ryan Reynolds. Yes, yes. I never saw it. Um, it's the ugly duckling that has grown to be a better, prettier right. person, and they come home for the holidays and blah, blah, blah. Wait, blah. no, no, no. The one, is that the one with uh He's him? in the fat suit. Oh, okay. I was thinking of a different one. I haven't seen that one. Mm. I, I'm not recommending you watch it, but I am saying that I, I have gotten a chuckle or two out of it. Um, my kids and I, we always watch uh, the Santa Claus movies. Mm-hmm. And the quality of those movies is inversely proportional to their release date. I can okay because like the worst one's the first, right? Second one's not bad, and the third one's. My th- the thing I really like about the third one, um, I don't know if you've seen any of them. I've seen the first one. Okay, the third one, um, has some time travel stuff at the end. Oh wow! And Martin Short plays, um, who what is his name? I forgot. Jack Frost. Right, mm-hmm. and he's trying to upstage Santa. And I think someone forgot to tell him that he was in the Santa Claus Three, or maybe it was just the fact that he doesn't get enough film roles that he's like, you know what, I'm going to play the hell out of I'm this. I'm going to knock this and out of the park. He gives it his all. Yeah, and he is fantastic to watch, and that's by far the best one. That one actually, it's almost like they pitched it as, tell you what, uh, Jack Frost tricks Santa into going back in time. And never becoming Santa, and then he has to fix it. Mm. And then they started to write the ten-page setup, and they got so into the family drama that it. And then they're like, "Wait, who, who do we get to play Mrs. Claus's father? We got Alan Arkin. We got to put him in this some more because that guy's awesome." Sure. And that became like sixty minutes of the movie, and then they did all of the the time travel stuff in twenty minutes, and had their nice little wrap up. Like it, they. I think they pitched a completely different thing than what they got because they just got involved in a little family drama. Sometimes yeah. the story just takes you away. Exactly. I, want to f- I want to finish up on probably both of our favorite uh, Christmas films. Uh, it's uh, from somebody that we talk about a lot on this uh, show. I think we'll talk a lot about it in the future. Uh, I believe it's called Medea's Family Christmas. <laughs> um, you <made> me snore. <laughs> <laughs> Go watch that, guys. It's fun. We all came here to talk about some hot guys. Oh, hot men. Yeah. It's men. raining men. Okay, so you've got right here, I'm, I'm taking a look at it. Do it, yes. It's a printout from The Atlantic. To be clear, that is a printout, a hard copy. I, I appreciate this because I hate looking we work at hard here. text on screen. Yeah, exactly. Um, the decline of the American actor. Why the under 40 generation of leading men in the U.S. is struggling and what to do about it. Because if there's anything we have to watch out for. It's those millionaire white actors. The white guys, yep. <laughs> that are under 40. The white guys are under attack now, people. We got to make sure they're okay. Um, Yeah, they, that's the question. That's a fascinating question. Basically what they're saying is, uh, where have all the cowboys gone? Right. Like, where's John Wayne? Where's Cary Grant? I where's Robert know, Mitchell? Cowboy, blah, blah. Yep. But yeah, uh, like, where's the uh, the Lee Marvins, the the Clint Eastwoods in his heyday and not, you know. The Kirk the Douglases, chairs. yeah. Kirk Douglas, you had... I think uh, I had Michael, Michael. there. Sorry. Um, Sorry, Kurt. That's my Michael ball. Douglas is busy getting cancer while his dad is turning 100. That's right. His, that guy's been around forever. Unbelievable. Um, I got a little thing I wrote up. Uh, basically, um, 
the idea of the leading man has changed over time. Because is it even an idea anymore? You know what? I think the whole idea of movie stars mm -hmm. is starting to wane. You know, people will see some movies based on who's in it, but if they made an, if they if a, a name actor got people to see every movie, you know, still, then Tom Cruise would have been able to get people to go see Eyes Wide Shut and Magnolia in the theater. You know. Oh, I thought you were going to go uh, sooner than that, and I've seen all of his new ones, like Jack Reacher and uh, that other horrible one, Cameron Diaz. So I still support him, but whatever. Go ahead. Right, but no, but that's that's <laughs> what I'm saying. But uh, Night and Day, that one. Yes, right? that, that, and, one, and that one. Got, <laughs> that was a movie, and that one got really good reviews, but people didn't go see it. Yeah. Um, and basically, I think that the role of the American male leading man has changed because. The idea of masculinity in America has changed. Um, I think it's fascinating that we do, and we absolutely have to separate the American actor from everybody else because right. it's a different training. It's a different way they approach the uh, the skill or well, I, the uh, talent of acting. I think it's also just body body type, too, because here millennials are portrayed usually as underweight guys, hipsters with scarves, wearing tight jeans. Not a lot of hair on their chest. Right. Drinking soy-based morning milkshakes. Those are good. I don't know what to right. say. Uh, twirly mustaches and complaining about everything and unable to change a tire. Right. Right. Okay. Meanwhile, you have like five Hemsworth brothers that are all over six feet tall and look like, you know, a Greek gods. That is true. And that's the kind of guy that we're getting from Australia. Right. You've you got Clive Owen, you know, coming from, he's over four. Yep. But those kinds of guys coming from uh, England, and America is turning out people like Elijah Wood. Absolutely, Paul um, Dano uh, is right. is a is a movie like Taken. Should that not have been a thirty five year old male actor that took that instead of a sixty five year old Liam Neeson? I think the fact that he was sixty five actually helped make that a success because people weren't expecting it, and that's also why the second and third one are kind of weird because it's kind of like oh we've seen this, you know. Um, but you don't see that a lot. Like we don't. It's been a while since Death Wish Three, where you have a sixty-year-old man ki man kicking ass. I may or may not have watched Death Wish Four uh, over I'm the weekend, sure but I, over the weekend it was um, thanks L Ray TV by the way for right. getting me started. <laughs> but I got a question: When you were a kid, mm -hmm. what were your friends' dads like? I don't have any friends. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I grew up in the country, so I had some uh, some farmers or some big burly guys. Yeah. Um, if you take a look at when we were kids, the guys, the typical guys, like the typical Joe, average Joe that you saw on TV was like Dan Connor on Roseanne. Right. Or, uh, Al Bundy on Married with Children. These schlubby, hardworking guys, kind of big, right? And CBS is still putting out those TV shows. Except they were in their late thirties at the time. Right. The guys in their late thirties now, you've got, you know, like the cast of Superstore. And the new girl, Big Bang Theory. And they're these tiny waifish guys wearing, you know, an 80s cartoon t-shirt. And I wear those t-shirts too. I can't, I'm not blameless. I'm a waify guy. But the thing is, you wouldn't have been the average Joe. Like, that wasn't the idea of the average American guy. Right. Back in the 70s and 80s. And I think because that shifted, and now it's more of, like I said, the the waifish, slightly effeminate hipster. That's why we have what we have. And that's also why The Rock, who should have been a star when he released uh, The Rundown back in 2003 or 2004, whatever it was, he should have been a huge star back then. But it took the rest of the world or the rest of our country getting fed up with what the modern idea of masculinity is to make him a star again and to make him the biggest star in the world. And that's why he is the biggest star in the world because he's not, and that's what we kind of, I think, have figured out. I think we're going to see more of a move back to that. Does that make sense? I hope so. Um, I think that big actors, big name actors, whether they be Shia LaBeouf or Paul Dano or even James Marsden we've been seeing on Westworld, they have 
James they, Marsden is like the bridesmaid of actors. Well, that's true because yeah. he was literally in. Wasn't he in that movie? The, the Twenty Seven Dresses. Yeah, yeah. yeah but he's like always the runner up and never the main guy. So you have somebody like that mm-hmm. that could, I feel like, that could play a character that would be a Robert Mitchum or could be a Lee Marvin, but they don't give him the opportunities to do that. Or maybe he just chooses not to do that. I think it's hard to because, like, hard for them because when you have somebody like, you know, you, when we first, I think, we're all introduced to James Martin and his X-Men. And as cool of a leading actor as he, leading actor as he is, as square of a jaw as he has, the entire movie he was standing next to a ripped Aussie who was six feet two inches tall. Right. And it's hard to get that stature out of you. Right? Um, And he seems a little small. And I think this really did kind of start with Tom Cruise, where he became famous as a teenager, basically. And he played those young boyish kind of roles. And that just kept going. And one of my professors in college called him, you know, the 50-year-old with, the the, the 50-year-old boy face. And that's what we've had for the last 15 years now. And I think people want something different, but I don't know if we're turning that out in this country, just in terms of the kind of guys who go into acting in America typically aren't the big burly guys. Right. For some reason, in other countries, they are. That that's uh, that is fascinating because one of the things that the article talked about was the training of an actor and mm-hmm. and whether uh, the American actor is just off of instincts or whether British actors or European actors in general are able to go to plays and productions and there's always going to be jobs and always going to be work mm-hmm. for that whereas you're not going to get that in America and even if you had that most of the American actors still that's just not their thing they're not interested in that they don't uh, they would never try to go out of their way to do it in a proper form that way. Now, this might be getting a little too philosophical, too into it, but do you think any of this has to do with um, the idea of the kind of person that goes into it, into acting? Oh, absolutely. Because, I'll put it this way, I was at a Target once, and there was this boy who had picked up a trumpet, and that was his thing. And he goes, Daddy, I want to play trumpet. And he goes, no, we play football. It's sad. The kid wants to go into the arts. Sure. Right? But a lot of boys who want to go into the arts will be big people. Mm-hmm. And you think if there's a guy, big, tall, strong guy who wants to go into the arts and his friends are calling him names, you think that's going to discourage him? Absolutely. But another kind of guy who isn't like that, he's not the football player, might not be discouraged and welcomed. <laughs> yeah. right? Or he gets called names anyhow, so what, what, exactly. what difference does it be? Right. Yes, absolutely. I think that that's that's the case. We have uh, such a weird um, thoughts and ideas in America about certain things like that yes. and uh, perception of somebody. I mean, there's a lot of people who just assume that guy was gay just because he went into theater, just right. because he did that, or just because he acted on stage, which is crazy to me in this day and age because it's all we all in performance. Like, that's all we do all the time. Right, and the funny thing is the same people that'll call a guy gay for wanting to be in a play mm-hmm. are the same ones who are like, uh, you know who's a real man? John Wayne. Mm -hmm. It's like, John Wayne didn't go to the war. Nope. And he spent most of his day in makeup and playing pretend. Which there's nothing wrong with that. No, there's not. But what I'm saying is... That's your... Yeah, that's their perception. That's perception. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So so what are we going to do? Is... is, uh, Are we just going to let... What's his name? Uh, Chris Evans just take all the the masculine leading roles or Ryan Reynolds? Uh, Chris is taking a lot of the women. (laughs) Ryan Reynolds is Canadian. And you said Ryan Gosling. Or I said Ryan Gosling. And, and he's Canadian not American. as well. Yep. Right. There are very few leading American male actors. And when the country latches on to one, and this isn't a young guy, but people, especially the internet, have gone crazy for Nick Offerman. And I don't know if you've seen him lately, but he's got a beard that's like a foot long. Yeah. And like he has leaned hard into this scotch woodworking man, you know? And yeah. that's that's worked really well for him. Not saying it's uh, not him, because I don't think it is. I think that's what people like about him, in all honesty. But why is it we're letting him play pretend and mm-hmm. go into makeup and not letting the younger guys? That's a good question. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I don't understand America anymore. Gone? 
and uh, well, they've gone into corporations and uh, they're doing different things now. I had a discussion with somebody the other night, and uh, you know, I think that that plays a little bit into this is just how men approach dressing, for example, in public. When uh, in the sixties and seventies, you were wearing a suit or you were wearing something. Yeah. You know, you I, I wear sweatpants everywhere I go. <laughs> And that's not, maybe not, my wife doesn't think that that's okay, but everybody else for the most part seems to think that that's okay. And that's just, a, uh, you know, some of the things that we put out, you know, some of the right. things that as human beings that we are portraying out there, and it's not, it, it doesn't uh, necessarily lend itself to being a proper man in the way that we've perceived it to be over the years. Thank God for Tyrese. Yeah, thank God for Tyrese. Thank God for uh, Basically anybody overalls. from the cast of Fast and the Furious. Uh, except Paul Walker. I'm just kidding. I miss you, Paul Walker. Never forget. He, um, he, we could remake him into a leading man and uh, on CG. It's weird how he never really branched out past that franchise. Uh, Blasphemy Sarah, Running Scare was a fantastic movie. I didn't watch any of that. Yes, because you do not watch great random thrillers like Knock Around Guys or Running Scared. <laughs> do you have somebody that you look for in the future that, that may be coming up, that may be somebody that, uh, that you think could fill that role? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, you had mentioned Paul Dano earlier. I, I, I he seem he always he doesn't seem like a leading man to me. He seems like uh, the weird best friend of the neighbor. You know. Um, I don't know. Like who's well, that's the thing. Like the the guys that are getting hired mm-hmm. are the the Shia LaBeouf. So I don't know. Like, and I think that with some work, he could be one of those people because he has such a, a hard upbringing. He has such a yeah a weird background that he has, uh, not on the farm or anything like that, but he's a very eclectic background, and he has pain, I guess, where he will show that to people. He will get into fights. He will be drunk at a play mm-hmm. in New York and get kicked out of, and that's at least the, the, uh, the thing that those dudes are doing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay, there, there's one guy who has been trying his damnedest to become a leading man. And for some reason, they won't let him. And people won't go see movies with him in it, unfortunately. Um, and that's uh, Zac Efron. I think he's a very capable actor. Mm-hmm. Good-looking cat, right? In shape. He could be a really good leading actor. But for some reason, it just hasn't happened for him. One guy who it has happened for, and I'm very happy about this, Channing Tatum. Yes. From dancer to star. From yeah, stripper to star. I was trying to be nice, but yes. And for some reason, um, I I don't think I should like him, but I do. And he's got that charisma that mm-hmm. you have to have as a leading man, and he can do comedy, which is you know that's nice. Right. Uh, for me, it's Michael Pitt. Uh, he has such an amazing ability to. He was, uh, let's see, he was in Last Days, Ghost Van Sant's Last Days. He played Kurt Cobain, quote unquote. Okay. Uh, he was in Funny Games. He was in uh, Boardwalk Empire. Yes. Uh, he, I think he keeps a distance from the Hollywood system uh, in a lot of ways, and that's that allows him you to. You and hating on the Hollywood system. Right? I love the Hollywood. I wish Hollywood system would love me. I have no desire to be an independent filmmaker. Uh, uh, give me bu- big budgets. I'll star in the next Medea film. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I don't care. But him, Michael Pitts has always been against that I think and not like uh he's never been like oh I hate them all this other kind of stuff he just chooses to stay independent uh with the films that he makes and the different kind of things that he does and he was great in Hedrick and the Angel- Angry Witch as well but that's my guy Michael Pitt okay I can see that yeah you let me have Michael Pitt or Scoots McNary oh I forget about Scoots I don't know how old Scoots is but Scoots is the best Scoots McNary um uh, well, I mean, I love Scoots McNary and um, uh, 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 Trouble Every not Trouble Every Day, uh, listeners, Killing Them Softly. Listeners, I think he's just making people Scoot up. Scoot is real. Scoot is not a he's real. He's from name. Dallas. No. Yes, he is. Scoot McNary. Let's see how old Scoot is. He's like seventy three. Scoot is not seventy three. Just just so uh, this is for us here in the studio. That's Scoots. That's Scoots McNary. Uh, Scoot. Oh, I know that. Oh, I know him. See, I'm saying I've actually directed him. Well, he's awesome. How did I not know? Him? And oh um, yeah, exactly. I'm very confused about this, sir. <laughs> uh, he is somebody. I'm trying to figure out how old he is, but he's somebody that could be somebody for the next 10, 15 years that can really do some interesting roles and some some man roles. But he is still kind of a small dude. They all kind of are. Yeah. Like 
There's nobody imposing. No, except for The Rock. Yep. And Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel's like five seven. Let's not but let's not big, play around. But he's big. Yeah. Schwarzenegger is like five five eleven. That's still bigger than Diesel. Diesel's a small fella. I mean, he's big, and but he was a, he was a bouncer. Right. I get all that stuff, but he's still short. And even he is in his mid twenties. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, he's almost fifty now, isn't he? Probably. Yeah. So he's definitely past. It. And besides the fact, he barely had one move. And by the way, he had his Charles Bronson one actor move, yeah. but that was it. Franco, no, 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 no. Um, I like to think that he tries. Yeah, he does try, but I think he's a little too goofy, and I think that works best leading man, not leading man, but you know, second second player. You know. Yeah, that's that's for sure. Uh, Scoot is uh thirty nine, so he still barely falls into barely. my category. Barely. We're still not finding any like young bucks. You nope. Know? I just don't. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. Why don't we leave him out? Because he's Jake Gyllenhaal. Okay. Um, he's a great actor. God, he can act. But there's something about his look. Uh, there's a professor I had who said he and his uh, his sister should not be allowed. They're too ugly to be in movies. They shouldn't be allowed in movies. Um, I don't agree with that. And I know he got really jacked for Prince of Persia. Mm-hmm. And then got crazy skinny for Nightcrawlers. Right, but there's something about his look that I think it's a little too crazy. And they're trying to push, uh, what's his name? Um, oh, my God, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. He doesn't and, work And he's a me. small guy, too. Doesn't work for me. Not for me either. Mm, he's, a, he's a second fiddle kind of guy. Yeah. So we've lost Leo. We've lost the old batch. Even Mark Wahlberg, you could have Mark said Wahlberg. in some ways, um, was, uh, was the, I guess, maybe the bridge. He was a man. Again, he's a tiny fellow as well. Maybe just actors are just tiny. We all need lifts in their shoes like Tom Cruise. Well, like I, five I, it's inch not lifts. so much the the actual physical height. It's how they carry themselves. You know? Oh, I agree. I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. But if you're only 5'7", it's just impossible to carry yourself like a six foot four dude. Exactly. Yeah. And then you have somebody like Brandon Routh who really is like 6'4". And just has a supple baby face. Yep. And he's a great actor, nice guy. But... Like I think that might be one of the reasons. Oh, oh, I was just about to name somebody, and then I realized he's he's British as well, Henry Cavill, or Cavill or whatever. Oh, he's definitely over forty though. Jesus? No, we're talking about Jesus, right? Uh, no. Yes, we are talking about it. If if who am I talking about? The, oh, the you're talking Super- about Superman. Guy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was talking about that other guy, Henry Cavill, is who I was talking about. Oh yeah, Cavill. I think he's like twenty seven. 28? Yeah, he's I can young. see it. He was good. In, um, uh, well, British. he was in a nice guy, so I can't hate on him. Yeah. I think so. Maybe I, I just lied about that, guys. I am sorry. Uh, he is a British actor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so. That's why I stopped myself. Uh, he's British as well. Uh, I guess we're uh, I guess we're out of American actors. But so. I mean, th- th- think, about, think about how how low we were on American action actors, because after Talented Mr. Ripley came out, if someone came up to you and said, hey, in 15 years, Damon here is going to be the biggest paid action star mm-hmm. on the planet. Would would you have believed them? No. I would have said Brendan Fraser. <laughs> That's called a callback, fellas. There we go. That's called a callback. That's all I've got to say. Dude. It's been a long time, 10 years since, and uh, we wanted to talk a little bit and reflect on Christmas movies of 2006. I always think it's nice to take a look back. 10 years is a nice round number, and it's nice to see It's nice to see uh, what people thought was good and just what was coming out in general. Sure, or know? what the studios forced on us. <laughs> yeah. There exactly. was a few of those on there. Um, uh, t- to me, Christmas and December time obviously means Academy Awards movies, trying to push it there at the end of the year. Um, right. I do always like to go to a film on Christmas Day, so I look forward to whatever the studio is trying to push on me at the time. And a lot of uh, kid-friendly uh, counter-programming to those movies. That, absolutely. There's right. definitely a uh, both sides of the spectrum. You get very serious, and then... Uh, like Cars 2 or something. Yeah, Cars 2. Yeah. Oh, that was a thing. <clears throat> so, uh, Cars 3 next year, baby. Uh, yeah, we can roll over from the last segment and talk about Mel Gibson again. Uh, Apocalypto. Apocalypto is one of these movies that it came out right as it turned out, you know, he, he wasn't maybe the, the nicest of guys. Sure. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing is, the guy knows how to make a movie. Without a question. And 
my favorite thing about the movie is there's a lot being said about what civilization means. Like, what is civilized? Because it starts out with that tiny little village. You know, they're out in the middle of the jungle. And it's a nice little group of people. And they meet the more civilized culture. Right. And they're sacrificing people and hunting people for sport. And the rest of the movie is basically a chase, right? And a race against that uh, that pit filling up, right? Okay. My favorite part is the last little bit. The last moment of the movie where they all stop and they see the ships. Because, wow, they're a lot more, quote-unquote, civilized right. than what we've run into before. And... What we know now, those ships basically wiped out the indigenous people. And I like what they're saying about how more civilized usually means brutal. And that the quote-unquote less civilized people are going to be uh, taken out. They're going to be exterminated. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting way of looking at things. And it's very bleak. <laughs> it's very, very bleak. Bizarre. Not a family movie. No. As I recall. Yeah, but uh, but it's it's fantastic. I haven't revisited it in some time, but it's one of those movies that I saw it with a, my my roommate from college, who happens to be Jewish, and he wasn't wanting to see it mm -hmm. because he was angry at Mel Gibson, and rightfully so. Right. And at the end of the movie, he just looked at me and he goes, "Man, I hate the fact that I love this. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. That is such a quality movie that don't, I don't think a lot of people know about." Uh, here's one that we've all forgotten, uh, one in the Leonardo DiCaprio canon, uh, Blood Diamond. Yeah. Also not an uplifting film. No. Also about an atrocity or yes. things that are atrocious. Uh, very boring, as I recall. I got a question for you. Yes. What happened to Joel Zwick? Uh, I, I do not know. He made Glory, which Shoot. apparently every kid in ninth grade is forced to watch yes. instead of actually learning <laughs> about the Civil War. They watch right. Glory. And then he made... He made a movie that I actually studied for an entire semester in college. There was a class where uh, you study a movie, you talk to everybody who worked on it, basically, but you never know what the movie is until the first day of class. So you sign up not knowing. Some people got Adaptation. Some people got Charlie's Angels 2 Full Throttle. I got The Last Samurai. Oh, wow. Didn't see it until I got into the class, watched the first day. Studied it for 15 weeks, did my final. They started playing the movie again. I waited for five minutes and left because I cannot stand that no, movie. Not very good, right? It is not good. But yeah, uh, Blood Diamond. Um, so maybe that's what happened to him. He made bad movies and people go, no, I don't want to watch this I, stuff I think anymore. he made long, boring movies. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. It's not... Um, you know, that aren't... Because here's the thing. As much as you might want to tell the tale of Blood Diamonds, right? right? Um, Maybe it's better in documentary show form. business. Yeah. And if people aren't going to see it, then you're not going to get to make movies. That is true. But yet, Leo keeps mo making movies. It's crazy to me. I can't believe it. <laughs> He's amazing. We'll talk about him later. Uh, do you remember the little movie? Uh, I believe it was George Clooney uh, called The Good German. I actually never saw it. Okay. Well, we can I, I, never, I, never, I never saw The Good German. Uh, the family movie of the year that people will definitely remember is Night at the Museum. The Ben Stiller movie. What do you think about that? I uh, also never saw that. I'm I, aware that's a thing that happened. I did see it. I saw it under protest. Mm -hmm. I basically saw it on a double date. Did not want to go see it and ended up having a ball. Yeah. And it's the kind of movie that we really need more of where, hey, this is not a stupid movie. It's actually pretty, pretty intelligent. There are some nice jokes with, you know, some of the old timers in it because you've got people like Mickey Rooney uh, and... Uh, Dick Van Dyke. Right. And they're doing some cool stuff. And it's something I can watch. I can I can enjoy it. I can watch it with my kids. As silly as that and as, you know, uh, boring as that sounds, it's, uh, it's a thing that needs to happen. We need to have more of these kind of movies. And it's one of the few movies where you have Ben Stiller giving a performance and not just putting on a mustache and a wig. But he did look great in that mustache. Though. Oh, he looks great in the mustaches, <laughs> but this is a performance and it's funny, and yeah, I like it. Uh, Good Shepherd was one about the CIA. I can only talk about that mm -hmm. one because I am two Kevin Bacons away from the CIA <laughs> uh, production person on that movie. Uh, 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 we call him uh, Uncle Milton, uh, Cousin Milton, excuse me. He's written a lot of books about Afghanistan. He was on TV mm -hmm. a day after 9-11 attacks, and 
I don't think this was Bin Laden. It seems kind of strange. It was a good movie. If you're ready for a three-hour CIA movie, it's a pretty good movie. Uh, Rocky Balboa. Let's pretend like that didn't happen. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, I'm going to say... No, 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 no. no. I'm going to say that if you look at the newest one, and you realize that Rocky Balboa did not need to be made. Now, it was, uh, it was our eye picture. Here's the thing. It wasn't Rocky V. Let's say Creed never happened, right? But it did. But let's okay, say, because okay. until this past year, right. we had sure. Rocky one through five, and then Rocky Balboa. Yep. And this is literally what I wrote. It's a movie that shouldn't have been made, but redeemed a once great franchise. And one of the greatest franchises in film history. Because you had the first two, which are amazing films. Also a franchise that killed itself. Nobody else killed that franchise. The, the third one was very good. The fourth one brought down communism. And the fifth one is one of the worst Brought down ever. Rocky Balboa. Yeah, it's terrible. And Rocky Balboa shouldn't have worked. And it did. I think it worked very well. And it was a nice button to his story. Creed is incredible. I love Creed. And it's basically a nice way of saying, hey... The thing that Rocky went through, a lot of other fighters go through. And this is a nice passing of the torch. But right. I think to end Rocky's story, Rocky Balboa did a much better job of that than Rocky V, and we kind of needed it. That's my take on it. Fair enough. All fair points. All fair <laughs> points. But most importantly, Rocky's here. Children of Men going to be here. Okay, Children of Men. Let's Let's end... Let's think oh. about 10 years ago when we first got to experience the glory that is Children of Men. I can't believe it's been 10 years. First of all, it's one of the only movies I've ever loved. Did you see it opening day? I actually saw it earlier um, at a screening. Uh, there was some like LA Film Fest screening or something. Nice. Um, uh, I also saw it early, like a week earlier. Yeah, I did too. But yeah. some rando screening, yes. And I usually don't like handheld movies. Mm-hmm. And I think there's one lockdown shot in that whole thing. Right. Including in the car, which is one of the greatest shots it, it's, the ever. Movie's, the movie's beautiful. The movie's perfect. And honestly, I think it might be my favorite movie since the year 2000. How many times did you cry? Um, in that one, I don't think I cried. Oh, I definitely cried. But my, you know what my favorite moment is? My favorite moment in the whole movie is when uh, the nurse, mm-hmm. they're going into the Fuji camp. And the pregnant girl's going into contractions mm-hmm. and she stands up to save her and basically sacrifice herself. Every other movie, every other movie would have had her being taken out and you would have seen her getting shot in the head and her lifeless body hitting the ground. Big shock and it would have been a terrible It's moment. a motivation for a character. It's an easy right. way to do that. But what they did here was so much more subtle and so much worse. They take her out they put the bag over her head. And the second they put the bag over her head, the bus starts moving. And then you see a bunch of people lined up with bags over their heads, then a bunch of people stripped down naked, and then a bunch of body bags mm-hmm. in that order. And you know what's going to happen to this woman without ever seeing it. Not yet. And it is so much more of a punch in the gut. And you just go, oh, no. Like, Let that's it for the her. viewer's mind figure it out. Maybe she got away. Maybe she didn't die. You right. don't know. But more than likely, she did. And my favorite thing about that movie has to be Clive Owen. Certainly. Turning out one of the best performances from a guy mm-hmm. in years. A broken man. Right. Just. Also, let's talk about the cover of uh, um, Ruby Tuesday. That sad, morose oh. cover of Ruby Tuesday is gorgeous. Everything about this movie is perfect it's that and minority report are the best two sci-fi movies of like the last 30 years like that sorry it's, it's truth we can probably kind of blows over that we'll do that later oh what are you gonna say solaris or something i was not gonna say solaris but, but um oh i don't know at the time oh, when was time crime put out how long ago was time crime, crime? the spanish sci-fi oh, oh. Nah. i don't want to say primer because i don't want to spend I, I, the rest of the day on talking about primer. Primer. <laughs> <laughs> but um I, I've never seen a, a world so fully realized. It doesn't feel like that was a production. It feels like the movie just exists in that time. Right. Um, I, I can't think of a negative thing to say about it. It's it's in my top five favorite movies of all time. It's just it's perfect. Uh, I cried when they shot uh, my my future wife. What's her name? Uh, the red Julianne Moore. They, yeah, that was very tough for me. I missed her after that happened. Yeah. And then the end. The end got me. I mean, the end. 
was so many things and it, it, it didn't put a, an, a pin on the end. You know, it just, here's what you had to, you know, it's, it's left up to you. What's the rest of the universe going to be? Do you think that the ending was reshot? Because it seems like with the tone of the movie, it seems like they would have normally gone out on just her in the boat and her looking up and seeing the ship come by was added very late after maybe some test audiences were like, guys, we need something. We gotta give sad. Something. Yeah. Because it seems like the whole thing is leading to, you know, the whole, the whole thing of, uh, the resistance is bullshit. Right. You know, um, what do you think? Do you think that was a reshoot or is that could have been, um, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Uh, cause I can see that without that ending. And, uh, yeah, it would have been pretty morose. Yeah. The worst thing about this movie is that not enough people have seen it. Um, I don't know if you've ever played the video game The Last of Us. But I don't know. It has literally the same plot, only <laughs> with zombies. Dystopian future, zombies everywhere, they're, they're infected. Mm -hmm. And they meet a girl who has been bitten and is immune, and they have to deliver her to the resistance so they can figure out what makes her different and save mankind. It's literally the same thing. Mm. And everybody says, oh, it's one of the best games ever made. We love it. This is incredible. But they haven't seen Children of Men because it's literally, and I, it's, it's great a great game. Right. But it's Children of Men. And more people need to see it. Its crime was that, I guess it was too dark, too bleak, and Crazy too talk. smart sci-fi to get American audiences. Into. Guys, let's talk about a little film, a little Joe Pesci film called My Cousin Vinny. That's the best movie. The classic 1992 American comedy film. Oscar-winning movie. Oscar-winning, starring the great... Joe Pesci. Ralph Macchio. Okay. Oh, Ralph Macchio, for sure. Yes, the great Karate Kid. And Marissa Tomei as well. She was fantastic in this film. Uh, Fred Gwynn. Uh, and Fred Gwynn, uh, last film before he died. Yeah, it was Herman Munster. Yeah, so um, great courtroom show. It's so good. And mm -hmm. so accurate that law schools actually use it to teach procedure. That is absurd. I believe you, but it's absurd. Well, yeah, I, and that kind of leads into what we're talking about. Because the tagline, I just want to say, there may have been many courtroom dramas that glorified the great American legal system. This is not one of them. Although it is. It really is. And it might be, I think, in the top three Hollywood-produced scripts, right? Not indie darlings, but when you talk about the Hollywood machine and what makes a perfect script, mm -hmm. uh, the example that was always used at SC, and it was in a book, I can't remember the name of it, the perfect script was Karate Kid. Classic. Wipe right. on, wipe on. Also, Ralph, Ralph Macchio. Macchio. And my other two personal picks would be Back to the Future 2, which we will talk about in a future episode because there's no fat in that. And We might come to blows on that. And My Cousin Vinny. Mm -hmm. Because My Cousin Vinny is one of the sharpest, strongest scripts. And I got a question for you. Yes. Who's the bad guy? The bad guy would have been... Nobody. Nobody. Because they're just doing their jobs perfectly. There's no malice. Mm -hmm. There's no ulterior motives. It's just they really think these guys killed... The clerk. Right, sure. And they think that this lawyer from New York is really just some guy kind of making fun some of them. Some dick from New York. Right. And that's not the case at all. And by the end, they're all waving to him goodbye because they were just doing their job. That's, mm -hmm. that's all it was. It's business. And the fact that you have a movie with that much tension, some drama, and there's no real villain, it's kind of amazing. And the fact that pretty much everything that happens in the first 20 minutes sets up something that's going to pay off at the end and get these kids out of jail mm -hmm. and from getting the death penalty. Right. And it's kind of brilliant. And even the wordplay, when they first get to jail and they say, you know what they do to guys like us here in prison? And then a couple scenes later, Vinny shows up, walks into the cell. His cousin's, his nephew's asleep. And he goes, he's asleep. I'm just going to start with you. And Lion's like, hey, 
no matter what, one way or the other, you're getting fucked. And, you know, he's talking about the fact that they're in a bad situation. Mm. This kid thinks he's talking about they're about to get they're about to get their salad tossed. S- yeah. Sexually uh, right. related. S- so even a little throwaway scene like that shows how clever the writing is. Mm. Um when he first sees the when he okay, when he first goes to the uh uh get breakfast in the morning. And he asks all the questions about the grids. It's really just because he's never had these. They look disgusting. Right. And he doesn't want to eat them, so he's stalling. But everything that he asks ends up paying off because it discredits that witness at the end. Um, everything with uh, his girlfriend being able to uh, know what mud in the tires are, all that stuff, right. um, pays off with her at the end where she... One of my favorite... <laughs> scenes with a description, something so detailed in its its uh its description of what's going on there it was perfect. I thought she did it perfectly, and it was it, it again goes back to that idea of misconceptions about people. You have these New York people coming down the south, and we think that's one thing about them, and that may be true about them, but there's also other things about them that are true as well. And they never really look down on the people in the south. It's just different. Or more the people on, in the south look down on them, right? Um, <laughs> or even playing against type. When he goes to confront the guy that hustled his girlfriend, he's like, oh, so either, you know, you can kick my ass or I can kick the shit out of you and get the $200. Like, oh, I'll kick the shit out of you. Right. And it comes back two other times. And when it comes to the fight, he just jumps at him and punches him in the face and knocks the guy out, takes the money. It's so anticlimactic, but it's it's brilliant in how they've set this up. And it's like, this guy has a foot and a half on Pesci. There's exactly. no way Pesci's going to take this guy. Yeah. And he lays him out in one punch. Little do they know he'd be in casino. <laughs> and then you learn everything you need you to know. You beat him with a bat. That's he right. comes back with a knife. <laughs> no, it's just the setup and payoff in this is so brilliantly done that, again, kind of like why I like Back to the Future 2, there's not a lot of fat in it. Everything has a point. There's not just a scene in here for the sake of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, when was the last time you saw it? Uh, the last time I saw my cousin Vinny um, was during a bad drug adventure, and my cousin Vinny was something that I turned to when I was a child that I enjoyed. It was a comfort food for me. Mm-hmm. So, um, me and my friends uh, turned to my cousin Vinny to watch it on the Netflix to calm us down from our drug adventure. That's the perfect way of watching that. That <laughs> was yeah. the perfect way. Uh, the accent, the two Utes. Um, just the whole shebang just really uh, nurtured me inside. Fred Gwynn's accent in that movie deserves a special place in heaven. Just that <laughs> accent. The only thing I don't like about the movie is the guy, and he, he's usually a good actor, and I usually like him, but the guy who um, the prosecutor brings in. The, the, the expert, special guy from the FBI. Expert witness, yes. Right. George Wilbur. Because he talks normally, but then he'll be talking like this and then say, Tar. And he leans so hard into it because mm-hmm. that one was the easy way. That that's the easy word for him to say in that right. fake accent. And that's literally the only thing about the movie that I don't absolutely love. And yeah, can we talk about the fact that she won an Oscar for this? Won an Oscar. When was the last time a comedy won an Oscar? Uh, I imagine it's probably been since 1992, <laughs> because they don't win a whole heck of a lot. No, they don't. They're not loved by the Academy. And um, especially one like this. I mean, it's not slapstick, but it's, um, it's it, I wouldn't say it's a quote-unquote smart comedy. I don't know what to compare that to, but I do think that the, it was perceived at least as as more of a goofball comedy. Right, and they, people didn't realize how smart it was. Right. Um, and if we, we want to just talk about, you know, the deconstruction of a scene. Take a look at, you know, your favorite scene, everyone's favorite scene, when Mona Lisa Vito <laughs> is mm-hmm, giving right. her testimony. Mm-hmm. Because if you remember, the scene starts, she's standoffish. She even says, I hate him. Mm-hmm. And they basically have to force her to sit down. And once, you know, he's setting her up the whole time. Like, he figured this out, you know, an hour ago. Yeah, That's why he rushed to get her and had the cop make the call. So he he got it. 
but he has to have her say it and he can't lead her on. Right. And when she finally looks at the picture and, you know, they have to force her to look at the picture and he goes, does the defense's case hold water? And that moment, I'm getting just thinking about it, the moment mm-hmm. where she goes, the defense is wrong. Yeah. And everyone else gasps and he's like, really? <laughs> are you sure? How is that? And she's like, oh, I'm sure. Like, and that's when it becomes the back and forth. I've got full on goosebumps. It's such a great scene. And that's when the back and forth between them is like foreplay. It's, and because we've seen it earlier. Right. They go through that kind of BS, um, we're going to pretend like we're in a courtroom before they get down to business, right? So they're basically having foreplay. That's not me. That was me, uh, guys. But they're basically having for like they're going through foreplay with each other in in the court. Right. Like, you know that night they had the greatest sex of their lives. Had right? to have. And the way that the whole case turns, the the performance, the writing, because again, it's all a callback. It's just it's so beautifully executed. I don't know. It's, it's my favorite courtroom courtroom movie. Nobody screamed. You can't handle the truth. Oh, thank God. Other than that, I think that it was a pretty excellent courtroom <laughs> uh, comedy. There was uh, there wasn't a lot of fanfare. Was how uh, you know it's still rated very well on Rotten Tomatoes. I believe it's eighty five percent, which is criminally low. It really is. Uh, no reason that I'm sure Groundhog Day has a ninety or something above. But like, who did you know? You'd be surprised with comedies. A lot of classic comedies. Like I looked at. Uh, um, you talking about Christmas movies, you know, uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Right. It's like a 60%. Yeah, that's, and you know, as soon as you said that, I realized, yeah, it's because we all, because uh, that wouldn't have been something that I would have rated very high. Right, but I mean, there are classic comedies that aren't rated high because comedy is subjective. And unfortunately, a lot of people, yeah, classic comedies are suggestive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, reviewers seem to have a stick, you know, firmly planted up their butt and can't laugh. Right. Um, that's coming from me. And I can I can be highbrow. Pauline Kale wrote some great reviews, but she would not have been writing about uh, Jingle All the Way. That's for sure. Well, I, I don't know if I classify Jingle All the Way as a comedy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't understand how someone can go into My Cousin Vinny and come out not having a good time. Even, even uh, and maybe it's just the fact that I'm a sucker for wordplay. But when they're doing the uh, interrogation, like, and that's when you shot the clerk. I shot the clerk. You shot the clerk. I shot the clerk. He's like, and then he's called out of the room, and he, then that's when he realizes, and goes, whoa. Like, that's when he realizes, oh, oh, I just confessed to yeah, murder. that's what it's all about, yeah. Because that person's not picking up on his inflection. Mm-hmm. Little wordplay like that. It's so clever. Maybe the people who didn't like it don't like clever things. Because a lot of people don't. And this isn't like I'm going to fall down all the time, although there are a couple of slapsticky parts, but the movie's not like that. It's not a gross-out comedy. Right. It's like, you know, with being a good lawyer is all about understanding words. And that's what this is. It's all about understanding words. And a good script is all about understanding words, yeah. too, and being able to know that you don't need all kinds of words to be able to put something across. You need it in the question, and then you need it as a – as a metaphor, and they need it as a different way, just right. like the, you know, going to, you know, that kind of stuff. Like so. ex- explaining, uh, trying to keep his job as their uh, defense attorney right. by doing the magic trick. Like that's, that's a brilliant little piece. So much so, it's so effective. My daughter, my seven-year-old, seven-and-a-half-year-old daughter, watched part of this movie with me the other day and saw that scene. And since then, she has been obsessed with sleight of hand. <laughs> She's been trying to do magic tricks on her own. Can you just not, uh, don't let her watch Mac, uh, Magic Men, though. That was not the kind of sleight of hand I enjoyed. No. Uh, so, uh, My Cousin Vinny, definitely watch it. Enjoy it. That needs to be one that's on regular rotation. That is one of yours that if you spend more than 10 minutes going, hey, what are we going to watch? Or even more than five minutes, just go to My Cousin Vinny because it's going to be a good time. It's comfort food. Yeah. It's a perfect amount of time. Perfect amount of joy. And unlike most comfort food, this ha- this is quality. Right. Well, that was it. The trio. We've gotten to three now. Those are trios, right? Yes. Or trace, if you want to say it in Spanish. Am I? San, if you're Japanese. I don't think anybody's listening to Japanese. 
but we'll find out. Hopefully somebody in Japan will let us know that they're listening to us, and that would be awesome. Uh, so we made it to the end. Any reviews of what we've done so far? I think it's been perfect. Oh, yeah. It's uh, without flaw. Yes. I mean, it's almost as if we're professionals not getting paid. <laughs> So uh, let's talk a little, um, one more go round uh, about uh, what you think about. What are you watching? What do you tell the people they are, should be interested in? You know, this is one that I haven't seen in a while, but you mentioned a movie that reminded me of it for some reason. If you haven't seen Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans. Mm, glorious. Oh, God. Everybody needs to watch this right now. I'll put it this way. If you can't enjoy... A movie where Nick Cage is high on crack and shouting, shoot him again, his soul's still dancing. And there's and iguana involved. Friends. Oh, my God. There's, there's a magical iguana. The, uh, a jail is flooded. Ava Mendez is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just, it, it's a movie that's so nuts, I can't put it into words. And that was from the uh, great... There in their hair zone. There you go. What a what a wacko and weirdo. So I'm going to do two then, if you're going to throw that one out, because I have to add another <laughs> Nic- Nicolas Cage movie to the fold. Fine. That's Dog Eat Dog. Yes. Uh, just came out. Uh, Paul Schrader, who uh, wrote... Paul Taxi- Shear. Or, uh, Paul Shear's in it, right? Yeah, Paul Shear's in it. Yeah, it's his movie. Did Schrader I call Schrader is the guy who... He wrote Taxi. Taxi, Taxi, Taxi Driver. Driver. Right. He's also in the movie. That's what I'm saying. Oh, Paul Shear is in the movie. Okay, I believe you. Okay. Um, so uh, that had Nicolas Cage, but he's a straight man in this, so you get a little bit of, uh, of both. But more importantly, I watched the best movie of the year just very recently. I definitely recommend. Not in a lot of places. So you're going to have to search it out, but it's called Nocturnal Animals. Mm. stars Jake Gyllenhaal, Amy Adams. Uh, it was fantastic. So weird that it was directed by a movie uh, or a uh, clothes designer, but hey, whatever works. Uh, it was excellent. Uh, it was cold. It nice. was uh, uh, violent, and it was beautiful. A lot of violent movies this year. That, Green Room. Sure. Yeah. Hell or High Water was not yeah. unviolent. Yeah. A lot of uh, violent movies. Don't Breathe. There was some violence in there. Yeah. My my top uh, top 10 list is coming out. I'm working on that right now. I don't think I've seen enough movies. This is the fewest number of movies I've seen this year since maybe 2003. I have not seen enough to make a top 10 list. But so far, my personal favorite mm-hmm. of the year is Deadpool. Mm. Well, it's since funny. I'm the expert over here, I will uh, I'll tell everybody what to watch the rest of the year. So look forward to my 2016 list. Then I'm going to put together a realistic one for people who like <laughs> things that aren't all artsy fartsy. Uh, well, you should probably. Well, no, I think I got some big budgets yeah. in there this year, but I also added that OJ doc. That yeah, but this is also doc. coming from the guy who made fun of me for thinking that Mad Max is great. I didn't say it wasn't great. I just said it wasn't the greatest film that's been made even in that year. Much less. No, no, it was the best year. film of the year. That's not true. That's totally true. So, guys, look what you have to give forward to next uh, time. Us fighting. Matt I think there's the a couple worst. times. Back to the Future 2 we're going to fight about. We're going to fight about Mad Max. It's going to be a good time. It's be like, uh, are we going to get a Jello wrestling thing going on? Uh, is that a fat joke? No, that was just the one time I got to enjoy a Jello wrestling event, and I've always wanted to see one again. But with us involved, I don't think it would be the same as you with know the what? lovely ladies. You know Mud wrestling, right. Jello wrestling, all that stuff never... Mm-hmm. My thing. I don't know what it was. Mm. Well, that's surprising. I just assumed that you, you uh, struck me as a mud wrestling, jello wrestling Maybe, maybe if you guy. get like four scotches into me, I'll, okay. I'll be different. All right, guys. So Mel and the scotches, send them to us at P.O. Box. I don't I don't know. We'll get uh, it. McAllen 12 or better. There you go. There we go. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you just, uh, just like some simple Johnny Walker for me. Not me. Just no. keep it keep it easy. No. Evan Williams, even. I'll uh, take Glenn Walton G, Quinta Raban. So uh, mail it to us. Follow us on the uh, World Wide Webs. You can fi- find us at Mattman and all the places that you would do that. At Matt Men. And probably through our, you know, our other pages as well. We should probably f- check to see if at Matt Men is taken. Um, I don't care. I'm going to take it anyhow. <laughs> we'll have a fundraiser with the peoples, and uh, they'll give us some money. There we go. That's what I'm expecting. Look forward to next time, episode number four of Matt Men. We'll talk about all kinds of things that I don't know what we're going to talk about right now. Episode four, A New Hope. There you go. Um, I think that that's a Star Wars thing, but I'm not it sure. Is. Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll talk about that next time too, because I don't understand anything <laughs> about that world. That actually be perfect because uh, Rogue One's coming out next week. That's a thing, huh? That's a big thing. That is a thing. Okay, guys. We'll we'll, we'll see you then. See you.